So, uh, yes. All right, Amy, I am assuming you started the recording. All right, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. So my name is Ben Cromie. I'm in the fifth year of my PhD here at the College of Optical Sciences. And uh, this is a virtual tour of my lab. Normally, you could just go to room 662 in the Meinel building and you would see it. But uh, since we're in the situation we are, we're going to try out this digital lab tour. So my lab works with an instrument called a multi-photon microscope. And a multi-photon microscope is a special type of microscope that is pretty neat. So when most of the time we think about microscopes, um, we're usually thinking about instruments like these. This is a light microscope from Zeiss. There is a bright light bulb in the back that uh, is gonna shine white light onto the sample. And were you here, you could look through the microscope objective and you would uh, see the sample in focus underneath it. Now these microscopes are used all over the place and they've been used for hundreds of years. But uh, the thing that our microscope can do that this one can't Ben, uh, yes. How much would a microscope like that Zeiss one cost someone? Uh, that's a good question. This Zeiss isn't too fancy, so this one is probably maybe fifty or sixty thousand. So still expensive, but not uh, not what most research instruments would cost these days. All right, let me just log into my computer here. So there's two reasons why you would use a multi-photon microscope over one of these white light microscopes. One of them is that we can see things without having to apply any stain to a sample. So what I mean by that, <clears throat> so these pictures, this picture up here is what is typically used in medicine. Usually when you get tissue from a sample, like uh, so this for example is a mouse's pancreas, and we are trying to see whether or not this tissue is cancerous. Usually what they do is they take this tissue, they cut it into thin slices, and they apply a chemical stain to it in order to give it this pinkish color. So this stain is called H&E. It's used pretty frequently to be able to tell uh, the structure of tissue. However, that process of cutting thin slices and staining it takes time. And when you're trying to tell whether or not something is cancerous very quickly, uh, time, like during the surgical removal, time is against you. So instead, you can, these four pictures are all from my microscope. And these are four different ways of gathering information from a sample without using stains. We use some pretty interesting physics called nonlinear optics, that that physics gives us contrast very, very quickly. So instead of creating this picture, we create this picture as a combination of these four images together. And this is, these are all added in false color. And while in this one, you can see that there's a structural difference between here and here. This is the cancerous region, and this is the healthy region. Down here, you can see that the signals that we're getting with my microscope are actually very different, which is a little bit easier for a computer to tell automatically whether or not something is cancerous or not. So that's one reason why you would use my microscope. Another reason why is that my microscope gets depth information. That white light microscope that you saw can really only see information at one focal plane. And as you move in and out of focus, there'll be other information that just kind of clouds what you actually want to see. But my microscope can get 3D information. So these pictures are all different depths of a lemon leaf, the tree, uh, blah, 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 the leaf of a lemon tree. And these are all different depths. So you can start to see the spine of the leaf come into focus and then the overall part of the leaf. You can see individual cells of the leaf. So that's pretty cool. Now you might ask yourself, having heard that information, why do people not use multi-photon microscopes all the time? It sounds pretty neat. 
cool part of it is that uh, while commercial microscopes like these do exist, they're pretty expensive. So the U of A has a multi-photon microscope. It's from Zeiss, and it takes up an entire optical table, which uh, one of these metal tables right here is, if you're not familiar with it, is an optical table. And it takes up about this whole thing, and the instrument costs about $750,000, which is pretty expensive. <laughs> uh, our instrument, which I'll show you this one, uh, this instrument, the whole instrument itself costs about 60000 and takes up quite a bit less space. Part of the reason why the instrument's much cheaper is instead of using these really big lasers, uh, very expensive lasers called titanium sapphire lasers, we use fiber lasers. Now, in the internet, you're, all of the information that you um, request in the internet will come over fibers. Um, and this is the same kind of idea. It's thin pieces of glass that carry, um, instead of you know, videos and whatnot, this is carrying a laser pulse that is very, very, very short. This laser pulse is only on for 65 femtoseconds, and a femtosecond is very short, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, so a femtosecond is to a second as a second is to about a couple, uh, tens of millions of years. So it's very, very, very short. And so the microscope itself, the laser sits up here, and there's a pair of mirrors that scans the laser beam back and forth across the sample. The sample lives underneath the microscope objective here, and these two very sensitive detectors called photomultiplier tubes pick up the signal and send it to my computer where I can then look at images later. So let me show you a few more images. Actually, before I, uh, I show some images, that went, we went through that a bit fast. Does anyone have any questions? I would happily take some questions. All right. Sorry, I was a little late, but how did you get it to be 60000 instead of the $750,000 value that you'd mentioned earlier? Great question. So part of the reason why is our instrument is not quite as automated. The Zeiss one has a lot of automated features, like you click a button and a new objective comes in, and I'm physically screwing and unscrewing microscope objectives by hand. Um, the other part of it is that the laser that we're using is more on the order of about $10,000 instead of the more $100,000 that the laser that Zeiss is using costs. Um, another nifty thing is these lasers have, uh, we can use inexpensive, well, relatively inexpensive detectors with them to see some of the information we need to see whereas with the shorter wavelength of the more expensive laser, it would be harder to see some of that information. You'd need a more expensive detector. So there's, there's, there's a couple reasons why. Ben are, you, ben, are you telling me that you're worth a few hundred thousand dollars then? <laughs> well, uh, that is the whole goal of getting out of this program with a PhD, right? <laughs> Any other questions? You have a question from Amy. What's your favorite part of being in the lab? Ah, yes. Uh, one of the things that I really like about being in this lab is uh, we really get to do a lot of different things. So the laser that I showed you and the microscope are things that we designed and built in the lab ourselves. So we get to build the lasers, use them in the microscope, and then use them in the applications like that pancreatic cancer research. I've gotten to do a couple different projects on pancreatic cancer research, which it's really amazing to get to make all of this cool technology and at the same time see the applications. So I just saw Amy's other question. So what's next for me is I, after I graduate this May, I'm heading off to Ball Aerospace um, where I'll be working to design NASA satellites and weather satellites and all that kind of fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. 
So let me send, uh, let me show you a few movies from the microscope. Since we get 3D information, makes for some pretty cool movies. So this is the brain of a fruit fly, believe it or not. So we took an image at several different depths and we use software to turn that into a 3D reconstruction of what that fruit fly brain looks like. You can see it kind of rotating around. Doesn't look very much like our brains, a bit, uh, a bit on the strange side to be sure. So this is, th these are the actual images that we took. Each picture that, each frame that you're seeing is a different depth of focus giving us that 3D information that I mentioned. Uh, this is a mosquito, a whole mosquito. This took quite a while to make. The green color that you're seeing is showing the exoskeleton of the mosquito, and the red color is showing more of the muscles of the mosquito. That green stripe in the background is the uh, cover slip that the mosquito was squashed underneath. We don't just look at biological stuff. Um, we've also looked at uh, gems and minerals, where this movie is looking inside of a gem called orange calcite. And the different colors that you're seeing are two different signals that tell us uh, different uh, information about the sample. It's, uh, this gem and mineral stuff is pretty neat because we were the first lab to try doing it. And we're working with the U of A Geosciences Department right now to understand more about the information that we see. So these are the brain cells. These are neurons from a mouse's brain. Another 3D construction. And uh, let's see, what's another good one? This is inside of a mouse's pancreas. A lot of pancreas stuff here. The red structure that you're seeing is collagen. Um, which is the structure that holds our tissue together. Those red dots are neuron or uh, the nuclei of cells. So yeah, we, uh, we do some pretty cool stuff in here. Uh, the College of Optical Sciences is a great place to be a student and I really enjoy it and I've enjoyed my time being here. Uh, I like showing the stuff that we do because it's our job at the end of the day as scientists to communicate information to the public because if we discover cool things in the lab, then we never tell anyone about it, then it's not a very effective expenditure of tax dollars. So glad to uh, take the time to show a little bit about what I do. Does anyone else have any questions? I can show you a little bit more the questions. What do you mean by photon? Ah, that is a great question, John. <laughs> so um, a photon, if you're not familiar, is if you know what an electron is, it's, it's a similar idea. Instead of uh, the smallest unit of charge, a photon is kind of the smallest portion of light that you can use for a particular wavelength. And these lasers are shooting bursts of lots and lots of photons, or these little packets of light down at the sample. We call it multi-photon because uh, we rely on the interactions of multiple photons with each sample. For example, something pretty neat that we can do is called third harmonic generation. And harmonic, it's just like a harmonic in the sense of music. You have a fundamental wavelength or tone that you would hear with your ear, and then you had have a harmonic of that, which would be a higher pitched tone. Now, third harmonic, we start with three photons of the wavelength we started with. And from interacting with the sample, there's the chance that you'll get those three photons to combine and get a single photon of all three of their energy, three, uh, all three energies of the original photons, which uh, since the energy and wavelength of a photon are related, I now have a wavelength at a third of the original starting wavelength. So I can show you a little example photo here. So this sample, I was shining light at 1560 nanometers at this sample, which is beyond what we can see with our eyes. And there's this brilliant green glow coming from the sample because a third of the wavelength of 1550 is in the green. It's about 520 nanometers. 
And on this particular sample, there was so much third harmonic that you could see it with your eye. There is no green light coming from the laser, but through this nonlinear optics physics, there's a brilliant green coming from the sample. Now, usually the sample isn't quite that bright. That's the reason why we have to use those high sensitivity detectors and the reason why my microscope lives inside of a black box. Usually there's doors in front of this so I can close it because the room lights are much brighter than the sample light. So I have to make sure I don't wash out all of the signal from the sample. But uh, yeah, the multi-photon part is the tricky part of understanding my microscope because you have to, I took the course that helped me understood, understand it my third year as a PhD student. So it's not uh, trivial stuff. <laughs> Other questions? I've got a question. You might have already answered it at the beginning, but um, when you're making those 3D reconstructions and stuff, uh -huh. do you have to make um, like each layer individually and like manually constructed, or does your equipment do it all automatically for you? Ah, well, uh, good question, Ryan. So, uh, fortunately, my software is set up that I can take these big stitches and 3D stacks automatically. So all I have to do is tell it how far apart I want each picture to be, um, what field of view I want, how many pixels I want, all that kind of thing. So if we do really large stitched images, which I can show you, uh, it's the same idea with these large stitched images. So this is the brain of a mouse. And you can see there's kind of individual pictures that were taken and all stitched together to give us this much larger perspective of the mouse brain. It's the same thing. My software will do the effort of moving the microscope, taking a new picture, saving it, moving the microscope, taking a new picture and saving it, which is good because some of these pictures like this one, which is the, a computer chip all stitched together, uh, this is nearly 5,000 pictures because the sample was so large and that would have been a real pain if I had to do that by hand. <laughs> Let's see, what's another few cool pictures? This is, a, this is a human ovary. The red color is showing um, something called second harmonic that uh, is showing some of that collagen again. And you can see kind of individual red blood cells left over that are dead at this point, but inside of these veins, these green dots, Other questions? So you mentioned earlier when you had the pancreas and how you had your mm -hmm. stain versus yours. So because you think it's easier to tell, at least like from the computer standpoint, which is cancerous and non-cancerous, uh -huh. have you thought about developing a program or software that automatically would read it and like ding at you if it saw something that was potentially cancerous? Yeah, so there have been a lot of uh, similar research projects that I've seen that have done something very similar to that. So we're the good and bad things about medicine is that medicine is slow, which is really bad right now, of course. Uh, but um, medicine is slow, which is good in the sense that you have to be methodical before you do something uh, really crazy, you know, prevent someone from doing something foolish. But the downside is that if you've got something neat like this that you think can help a disease is pancreatic cancer, which is the worst survival rate in cancer currently. Um, it, it takes a while. So we started working with cell models. We're just now, that picture that you saw is part of a paper that's going to be published this month um, on working with the mouse model. And then, yeah, we'll move to doing more automatic stuff and then move to doing human tissue eventually. Great question. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Ben. Yeah. Um, when you were developing M6, um, mm -hmm. was there a major um, consideration for like uh, the signal to noise ratio required to do this? Like, do you need a certain SNR to achieve imaging with multi-photon microscopy or is that not the right way to think about it? 
Well, it is an interesting question. Um, these processes are called nonlinear optics because the signal generated depends nonlinearly on the laser power. So a small increase in laser power could increase the signal that I'm seeing by a cube. So yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of the signal to noise stuff ends up being somewhat more of a laser question than the microscope question. Um, so I do certainly think about uh, one of the advantages of the all reflective microscope that you're referencing is that because it's mirror based, I have really high throughput. So the amount of laser power that I'm getting in to a sample is much higher than traditional microscopes. Most of the microscopes that you would get um, from these large microscope manufacturers like Zeiss and Leica for say a confocal microscope, which also gives you some 3D information. Most of those microscopes only have 10%, 20% throughput. So the amount of laser power that you're getting in is much less by the time you get down to the sample compared to our microscopes, which are more like 60 to 70%. So we do think about those kind of things. Um, John would probably be disappointed to hear that I didn't do a extremely thorough radiometric calculation on M6, but uh, that's probably okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Ben, I, I posted a yeah. question. How long does it take to stitch together the images, especially with the depth? Oh, yeah, good, great question. So some of these can be pretty long. Uh, our microscope isn't particularly optimized for speed because it is lower cost. For example, so this picture, this is a 3D stack from an amethyst sample. And you can see that we did a 3D stack that was two millimeters deep, which is quite deep. Uh, that took about two hours to do because um, we were taking a picture every micron. So that's, uh, oop, I lost my camera there for a second. So that's 2,000 pictures in about two hours. So that's, that's probably about typical. So each picture is a couple seconds. It depends a lot on the resolution that I'm using. Um, if I do a much coarser sampling instead of doing every micron, if I do every five microns or every 10 microns, it'll go much faster, of course. When I'm working with live, tis live tissue, I can't really afford to be as, uh, as uh, slow with my stitching. It's gonna dry out. Anyone else? Thank you, Ben. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining this uh, virtual lab tour. And you should check out the other ones that the College of Optical Sciences does, because you're going to learn really cool things about the stuff that we do here. All right. Thanks for joining. Bye, -bye everyone. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. All right.